This is Larry the Barber Man, and today I'm at the Barber Expo in Connecticut. I'm here with none other than John Mosley, AKA Popular Nobody. John is a celebrity barber. He's one of the most sought after educators in America or North America at the moment. We're hoping to get him over into the UK, but we'll discuss that later on today. Uh, John is also an ambassador for Andis, Paul Mitchell, Hanzo shears or scissors as we call them in the UK and the list goes on but I'm just keen to get into John because he needs to get back to the Hanzo stand and deal with his thousands of followers. So John you've been in the business for 16 years before coming into barbering you was a college football star or student? I, I wouldn't say a star, nor would I say a student, <laughs> man. Um, I was a student athlete, but I really didn't go to class. And, you know, uh, college just isn't for everybody. And I was one of the guys that college wasn't for. I would go, you know, just for the sports. And then I realized, like, as an athlete that, you know, they really don't really care much about you unless you play sports. And, you know, I didn't want that to be my education journey. And then I got tired of getting hit by grown men for free. I was like, this hurts. So I was like, you know, went home and it was like, mom, put me in barbering school. And I was joking. I was just trying to buy some time so that she would, you know, get off my back as a mom does, you know. And two days later, I was going to barbering school. And, you know, ever since then, I thank my mom every day for that because it has definitely changed my life and gave me a different, different life for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've just watched you on stage here at the Barber Expo 2017 and you know I've escorted you down to this here which is the press room and it was like you were the celebrity you know so many people came up and congratulated you and thanked you and said how great your set is was and one gentleman even said that he never learns anything from educators but he learns something from you so tell me how where your journey of education actually began? The, my education journey, you know, it, it began when I was in Barber College. I was, you know, doing my thing and just having fun with it. I started to find my niche in, in, in barbering and my mom was an educator. So she would always put on hair shows and by her putting on the hair shows, she put me on a stage. And when she put me on stage, she had someone like basically hackling me in the back, just asking me question after question. And I was still a student at the time. And so that's how it all kind of got started. And then once I got into the barbershop after getting my license, I just started going to barbering, not barbering schools, but cosmetology schools. And the reason why I went to cosmetology schools is because I felt that that was the missing link. We knew something that they didn't know and they wanted to know. And so why, when you, I feel like in anything in life, if you find the problem, you become the solution. And I just went to cosmetology schools and said, hey, would you like a men's cutting class? They were like, yeah, that would be awesome. So I just started teaching, going back and forth, teaching at different schools around you know, my community, my area. And then all of a sudden, I became more comfortable and comfortable with it. And you know, as of today, you've seen the, the energy that I bring on stage. I'm comfortable there. Like that, it's not, a, it's not a, no fear when I get up on stage. I want people to be engaged. I want them to learn. I want them to talk to me and I want to talk to them because I want you to walk away from one of my classes feeling like you've learned something, you gained something, and if nobody else was worth the price of admission, at least I was. Okay. And you spoke on stage saying that uh, four years ago, someone doubted your ability to be able to do half of what you're doing today. Mm -hmm. Tell me what that experience did to you. Um, I played sports growing up, and I love the, the challenge aspect of when someone tells me you can't do this, because I feel like being a young African-American man, you always get told you can't do something. You can't be this, you can't be that, but you can be put in a box and be this. And so when that was brought to my attention and, and you know, it was said that you, know, you can't do this, I took it upon myself to show the world that no one would ever say that I can't do nothing else. And when I wake up every morning, that's, that plays in my head. Oh, you can't do it. And I'm gonna I'm show you, I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna do it 10 times better than you thought I would ever do it. 
Okay. So, not only is your talent taking you all over the country, I mean, on the way down the escalator, you showed me your uh, American airline loyalty app and it had 51 segments and so many zeros on the end. That was just this year alone. Yeah, from January 1st, I've already been on 51 flights. As a matter of fact, I got another flight out tonight at seven o'clock because I have three classes in Ohio tomorrow. And so I've been on 51 flights as of right now with over 50,000 50, flight miles for the year. So yes, you've been all over the place on planes. Um, I also introduced you as a celebrity barber. You told me some of the names that you cut hair for. Do you mind, for the purpose of the cameras, the names that you can mention, mention some of those client, celebrity clients and how, more importantly, you got those clients? Um, yeah, my clients, Kendrick Lamar being one of them. Um, I started out with Kendrick a while ago and he was juggling between me and another barber and then you know, he kind of went with the other guy for a while, and then he came back to me, and I've been working with him for the past four years. So Kendrick, uh, the Washington Nationals baseball team, whenever they're in California, I go up the coast with them at times. I work with some of other baseball teams as well, some NBA players. I work with the NFLPA at some of their, you know, events. They come hire me and bring me along to take care of their, their, their clients as well, which are the players. Um, Idris Elba, another big client. Of, English know. boy. Yeah, he's an English man, you know, and uh, he's an awesome dude, by the way, you know, and I've been on tour with Eminem's camp and Rihanna's tour, Eminem and Rihanna tour, and, you know, just, I got my hands in a little bit of everything because I feel like hair gives you the opportunity to go see the world without being in the military. You know, and so I want to take full advantage of it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I never quite looked at it like that. A lot of people, as you quite rightly said, join the military because they want to see the world and they feel that's the only occupation that can take them there. And you've kind of, I don't know, uh, gone past that and yeah, you know, I, I, living I, that with the shears. Yeah, doing that with, with what God-given talent I got. So, popular nobody, obviously that's a kind of big lie and a fallacy, as you are extremely popular. Where did you, how did you come up with this name? The way I came up with the name, it was, it's crazy. Me and my client were sitting in the chair, you know, barber to client relationship, we're just laughing, joking. And he was like, you know, going down the list, kind of like what we just did, like celebrities I work with, things that he's seen, you know, because my clients know when I'm not at work, why? You know, I explained to him, like, hey, I got to go do this shoot for this, this, and this. And so he was just sitting in a chair one day, and he was like, man, like, your work is everywhere, but nobody knows it's you. You're kind of like a popular nobody. And I was like, I like that. That's simple. That rolls. I was like, that's, that's a movement. And then that's how it all came about, just simple barber-to-client conversation. And, and I've created a brand, and that's, that's what it is. So you're popular in America. The big question then arises, when are you going to come to UK and share these educational talents with us English boys? Right now, this is the start. This is the start of me making my journey to the UK. I've reached out to a couple people, you know, on Instagram, and I, I feel like sometimes Instagram is your credit score. So maybe because I didn't have the high numbers on followers, it, I don't think people paid attention to the content or they just didn't know me as a person, my personality. But I hope now this interview here changes their thought process on, you know, bringing this, this popular nobody out over the pond and, and let me have some fun out there because that's something I want to do. I want to share my knowledge with the world. And I think I'm doing it in the States pretty well and I want to take it over to, you know, to the UK and just have some fun. Just cut hair. That's my passion. Okay, so I'm putting out a shout now to Justice at the London School of Barbering. Justice, this is the man that just go over some of the names and places that you are educating for in the forthcoming month and who you've educated for in the last month because this is just insane. And well, in, a, in the month of April, yeah. I've been to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Columbus, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, um, Dallas, Texas, Houston, 
Little Rock, Arkansas. That's L.A. That's just to name a few that's happened in the month of April. I'm doing about 30 classes a month. Name and some of the brands. Name me oh, some name of the, the brands that uh, you're educating for. Uh, well, a lot of people don't know, but I actually had a large part of the Paul Mitchell barbering curriculum writing that, being a part of their video edit uh, content and, you know, voiceover writing for it. And, you know, so Paul Mitchell, Hanzo Shears, I go in and teach for their men's grooming classes. And this, of course, men's grooming classes for Andis. And, you know, that's just just what I do. I could cut hair with clippers. I could cut hair with shears. I could cut hair with a razor. Whatever you want me to do and the way I break it down, it, it's to the point to where anybody should be able to pick up where I left off and continue to cut and grow from that point. So there you go. Gary Spencer, Great British Barber Bash, Justice, London School of Barbering. That is the pedigree of man that the Larry the Barber Man has been privileged to have in front of his cameras. I say no more. You've been called out. Do something about it. Yeah, you, I'm here. Let, let's, I got a pass. I travel with my passport. It's in my backpack. So if you, Larry, if you get a phone call right now, I'm ready to go to the airport, man. Okay, I got you it. Go. He didn't have to travel the world with the military, but he can travel like the military. He's ready. Yeah, to ready, ready, ready to be deployed to the UK. Man. I, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you've done a lot in your very short career, John. What would you say your greatest moment in barbering was? Honestly, the greatest moment for me, uh, I think that was a question that was asked in the class earlier. And honestly, one thing is most people don't get to share their career with their family. A lot of it is separated. And the, the awesome fact that my mother is one of my mentors, to be able to st share a stage with my mother was a great feeling. And then having a page a two-page article in American Salon featured as, you know, a centerfold of the wise guy, I felt like that's a major accomplishment for me and, and career-wise. Okay, excellent. And what is it, well, we had the pre-interview and I asked you, what changes would you like to see changed in the barbering industry? And you said, in no uncertain terms, microfibers and Photoshop. Tell me your aversion to these two things. I feel like, you know, as men get older, they start to lose the testosterone and, you know, we start to pre-meld pattern baldness and things happen, of course. But I feel like the more and more you falsify and give false hope to the client from microfibers and, you know, that aspect of it, it's kind of turning the game wrong. And a lot of guys will say, like, you know, it doesn't matter. Women wear makeup. Guys, this is like a guy's makeup. I understand that, but my thing is this. Are you hiding your work because your work isn't good? Or are you trying to really build this guy confidence back up? A lot of barbers I see nowadays are using fibers as a crutch. And I feel like that's not the essence of what we do. It's not about, you know, making guys look so perfect. You're a man, you shouldn't look so perfect. You should be manly still and still look nice and decent. Some of the best haircuts may come out on a guy who's receding because what you're doing is turning your creativity and your art form to a challenge and fixing the challenge. Like I said in the beginning of the interview, you know, you find the problem and become the solution. And sometimes microfibers is not always the solution. Now, on the other side of that microfiber thing is I work in Hollywood. So if I'm on set and the camera is beaming down from a top view of a camera shot, then yeah, you want to fiber that area so that it doesn't have the light reflecting off of this guy's head. So in that aspect, I'm cool with it. But I don't feel like it should be in the barbershop an everyday thing. Photo shoots, if you got to use them sometime, that's great. But, you know, the everyday photoshopping and everyday microfibering just for someone to like your photo just for a repost or just for another the barber to like your photo, I don't feel needs to be used. Like, I feel like now with Instagram, everybody want Insta famous. They want to be famous. They want to be the big guy, the big dog. And it's like, quite naturally, like you don't really need to be the big dog. You just stay in your lane and put down your own pavement and you become the man of what barbering really is. And that's the community. You give back to that community and you 
don't worry about what goes on on Instagram. You worry about what goes on in your shop and making guys, you know, still stay manly without being so perfect. And earlier I mentioned you as an ambassador for several bands. As you know, my gig is I interview barbers. My second part of my gig is I show barbers how to improve their tools. I watched you on stage. You're an ambassador for Andes and Hanzo Shears, and I can genuinely see that these are your tools of choice. It's not for monetary gain. Tell me why you choose both of these. A, Andes for the Clippers, and B, and also uh, ambassador for Feather, Feather, Feather Razor as well. And the, the reason why all three, you know, and this is for young barbers, understand something. NASCAR, you see a car go around the track. It has many sponsors on that car. We are cars. We run the track. So you guys have to understand that there's ways to get sponsorship. You just got to find the problem and become the solution. But the reason why I choose Andis Clippers is because they fit for me. They fit what I like. They fit my hands. The motor speeds are great. You know, it's a great company, U.S. made, right there in, you know, Wisconsin area, like the Chicago area. I, 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 have a, I don't have issues with my tools. And they're easy to fix. When you open them up, there's, they're right there. You can fix them yourself. So that's why I love, and, you know, and being a barber for so long, I just know the comfortability I have with those clippers and they become one with my hands and they're my paintbrush. So I feel comfortable with them. Then with Hanzo shears, it's having the right shears for the right situations and being able to create and form. I feel like the shears cut really great. It leaves the hair really nice and polished for me. Um, the, the type of steel, the Japanese steel that uh, gives me the compound of wet and dry or if I want to cut just wet, the balance on the shear, the weight of the shear, it's not always heavy. It's a nice even balance. I'm a larger guy. I have larger hands. So the weight balance for me is really big and I love the balance that I have with their shears. Then for feather razor, when you're working with a straight razor, not every guy have the same skin type when they sit in the chair as the next guy. So being able to bounce from different razor blades selections gives me the opportunity to ch take on any challenge that sit in my chair. That's why I use Jatai feather blades because of that. I get the option to have any situation sit down I have an answer for it. Okay, I'm with you. That's someone else's brand. Now tell me about your brands, because I'm sure, you know, again, after seeing what I saw on the stage, people would want to buy your brand. What, what are your physical products? Um, my physical products, I have a barbering case that's, uh, that I have out. It carries five clippers in it, Velcro strap, because I am on the go. It was a problem. Opening up my kit, kit chipped, blades chipped, everything shifted around. So what do I do? I find a solution. And I created a barber case that holds five Velcro clippers and Velcro straps individually that I can have secure when I'm moving around on the plane because I don't separate from it. So I have to protect my investment. So it holds all my shears, my razors, my combs. I also have a five set of popular nobody combs coming out um, next week. So, you know, I feel like if I'm using these combs, they should have my brand on them. They should have my name on them because I love the way they feel. I love the way they work. So why not give my set of combs to match my case, you know, we got socks. You can see we got the hat, you know, we got lapel pins, t-shirts. I feel like my brand is not just a hair brand. Even though I am a barber, my whole theory behind it is that everybody is a popular nobody. You have five friends, a sixth friend come up, you don't know that sixth friend. The five friends that do know you, you're popular to the five, but he like, man, who is this dude? Like, he ain't nobody. So it kind of goes to that. It's like, that's the whole thing. It's not just about hair. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. You love what you do. You do it for what you do it for. You, you know, don't talk about it, be about it. You, you know, ain't no point of bragging. Just go get the job done and do what you got to do. So that was kind of like what created the popular nobody brand. And that's why you see the socks, you see the hats, 
you see the you know shirts, not just everything hair. I have hair stuff, and then I also have life stuff because at the end of the day, I want my son to be able to run around on the playground and be like, Dad, this kid thought my popular nobody shirt was cool. That makes my son feel good. You know, that makes people feel good when they walk around and somebody say, I like that shirt, that popular nobody, I like that. It's a feeling that, you know, everybody have in them, but nobody figured a way to bring it out. And so with my brand, I'm bringing it out in the hair world, I'm bringing it out in the life of the old and young. Okay, so I just want to close on your services. Tell me a little bit about your educational services and you actually have an artistic team. We didn't mention those. Tell me a bit about your artistic team and what they bring to the table. My artistic team first, I, I, you know, when we say it's my team, we're all the team. You know, I feel like the best way to hide a, a general is he moves like a soldier as well. And for me, we're all family. I mentor him first because, you know, if your insides are not good, your outsides don't matter. And so I mentor him first and we talk every day. We, I send motivational quotes. I talk to them about life, family, what's going on with them. Then we talk about hair. And then from that aspect, you know, I have two people from New Orleans, one that does natural hair, Maya the Lock Queen. Then I also have d Nix the Barber out of New Orleans. His fading style is nice and he does graphics really well. Then I have Trevor Moots, Mr. Taylor Fade out of, you know, Florida. I have Larry the Legend out of Florida, I'm Mr. Pure Perfection out of Florida. I got guys in California, Max, uh, Hair Max 90, Josh. And what we do, we just bring our style of education, meaning you're gonna come in, you're gonna sit down, we're just gonna have fun. We're gonna talk to you and give you what we give you. The diversity of not just being African American, but, you know, here in Connecticut, I got Arif on the team. He's right here from Connecticut on a barber shop and you know he's Pakistan. You know, and we just do what we do. Like we have a license to create and we have a license to have fun. And when we all together, we come together like transformers and bring great education, great, you know, time, fun. We're gonna laugh and joke with you. We don't take it serious. We take it for fun and that's what it should be. Okay. And in closing, what words of advice would you give to that barber striving for great things who might be down on his luck right now? I would say for the barber striving to be great, you know, the few things that I, that I look at and that I value, you know, respect your journey. If you don't respect your journey, it won't respect you. You know, invest, not just invest money, but invest time, put back into you what somebody else put into you. Meaning, if you were in a class for three hours, you should be at home practicing for four hours. You know, investing back into you. Money, of course, you're gonna invest in tools and products and stuff like that to invest, but sometimes it's not necessarily always that. It's about the time you put in. Um, respect the journey, invest, you know, be a, be a solution, not a problem. You know, and love life. Love what you do, love the people that you put in it, and understand that the largest room in the world is room for improvement and never put a cap on your room. Like just keep growing, keep going. And you know, like I always say, my, my motto is I'm a popular nobody. And the only way to remain that is by staying humble and hungry. And when you're humble, that means people want to work with you. And when you're hungry, you're going to always go out and find it. And that's just the way I live. I wake up every day hungry and humble. John Mosley, thank you so much for that interview. I kind of sat here and got all relaxed and I was absorbing everything you was telling me and kind of figuring out my next move in life. So I salute you. It's a great interview, a great thank lot you. of information and content for anyone who's nobody and wants to be somebody. So we're out of here. Thank you.